Infectious diseases, basic terminology. Perhaps you all know that infectious diseases are the diseases that are caused by microscopic germs or parasites that get into the body and cause problems. In this video, you will learn basic terminologies that we use to describe infectious diseases. A host in the context of infectious disease refers to an organism from which a parasite obtains its nutrients and shelter. A pathogen is usually defined as a microorganism that causes or can cause disease. Infectious diseases are also known as communicable diseases or transmissible diseases. They are illnesses that result from the infection, presence and growth of germs in the individual human or other animal hosts. Yes, humans, animals and even plants are all can be hosts for various parasites including pathogenic bacteria, viruses, yeast, protists and even worms and insects. You perhaps heard term contagious diseases. All contagious diseases are infectious diseases, but not all infectious diseases are contagious. This is because some, but not all, infectious diseases spread directly from one person to another. Some infections spread to people from animal or insect, but are not contagious from another human. For example, Lyme disease. You cannot catch it from someone you can in out with or pass in the street. It comes from the bite of an infected tick. According to the CDC, there is no evidence that Lyme disease is transmitted from person to person through touching, kissing or having sex with a person who has Lyme disease. Though untreated, Lyme disease during pregnancy can lead to infection of the placenta. Another example is tetanus. Tetanus acquired through infection of a cut or wound with the spores of the bacterium Clostridium tetani. But tetanus cannot be transmitted from person to person. So the disease is infectious, but not contagious. Botulism is not contagious as well. It cannot be spread from person to person. Foodborne botulism is caused by eating or drinking something that is contaminated with a botulinum toxin. This is produced by a bacterium Clostridium botulinum. This toxin affects the nervous system and causes paralysis. Contagious diseases such as flu, cold or strep throat spread from person to person in several ways. One way is through direct physical contact, like touching or kissing a person who has the infection. Another way is when the infectious microbes travel through the air after someone nearby sneezes or coughs. Let's take a look at Ebola. The disease is extremely infectious, but not extremely contagious, meaning it takes an extremely small amount of viruses to cause illness. It is not extremely contagious because the transmission occurs through contact with infected blood or secretion. It is not airborne. Non-communicable diseases are not passed from person to person. Examples of non-communicable diseases are heart diseases, chronic respiratory diseases, diabetes, cancer and others. Most of them are due to genetics of individual or unhealthy behaviors such as smoking, excess alcohol, unhealthy eating habits and physical inactivity. But let's focus on the infectious diseases. If one to describe the infectious disease, one has to cover the following topics. First, I will list them for you, and then I will elaborate on the covering the terminology necessary for you to know. I will list an order in which students are expected to describe an infection disease during presentation or written report for submission to an instructor. Of course, the order of the characteristics may vary depending on the instructor. I present just the general topics to be covered. After naming the disease, the first should be covered a causative agent of the disease. Then signs and symptoms of the disease. Good to elaborate on the pattern of the disease, describing stages of the disease. Point on reservoir of the disease. If you do not know what it is, just stay with me. I will explain each of these terms. Transmission of the disease is another important point. Every report on the disease should be done with the main points of the epidemiology of the disease and diagnosis and treatment. And the last but not the least, it is important to elaborate on the prevention of the disease. It is okay if you did not understand some of the terms because now I will elaborate on each of the topics. So let's start with a causative agent. A causative agent is an organism or a chemical that is responsible for development of a disease. A causative agent usually refers to a biological pathogen or toxin that causes a disease. 
It could be a parasitic protist or parasitic worm. It could be a bacterium or bacterial toxin. It could be a fungus or a virus. Once again, a causative agent is an organism or a chemical that is responsible for the development of a disease. Causative agent usually refers to a biological pathogen or a toxin that causes a disease. It could be a parasitic protist or parasitic worm. It could be a bacterium or bacterial toxin. It could be fungus or a virus. Parasitic worms cause filariasis. A common name of the disease is elymphantiasis. The adult filarial worms are parasites. They live in the human lymph vessels. They mate and produce millions of microscopic worms, also known as microfilari. Other types of parasitic worms cause ascariasis, tyaniasis, and cystisarcosis. These parasitic infections can cause diarrhea and fever. Types of roundworms in humans include pinworms and ascaris. Often roundworm infections can come from traveling to countries with poor sanitation and hygiene. Worms are mainly spread in a small bits of pieces from people with a worm infection. Some are caught from food, but filarial worms that cause filariasis spread to humans by mosquitoes. Protists are eukaryotes that can cause diseases in humans and animals. Parasitic protists cause some of the most well-known human and animal diseases, such as malaria, toxoplasmosis, amoebiasis, African sleeping sickness, Chagas disease, leishmaniasis, and diarrheal illness of protozoan origin. Bacterial infections are any illness or condition caused by bacterial growths or toxins, poisons. You can get sick from getting harmful bacteria in your skin, gastrointestinal tract, lungs, heart, brain, blood, or anywhere else. Bacterial toxin damage the host at the site of bacterial infection or distance from the site of infection. Bacterial toxins can be single proteins or organized as oligometric protein complexes. Viral infections are any illness you get from a virus, a small germ that uses your cells to reproduce. Common viral illnesses include cold, the flu, COVID-19, stomach flu, HPV, and herpes simplex. Herpes simplex virus causes cold sores. Another common term is fever blisters. People do not like to say they have herpes, so they say, oh, I just have a cold sore, or oh, I just got a, got a fever blister. Cold sores and fever blisters are two names for the same herpes infection. It is infectious and contagious. Viruses and bacteria often can cause similar symptoms like fever, cough, and rashes. The only way to know what kind of infection you have is to have a medical doctor assess you. In developed parts of the world, it is estimated that at least 60% of infectious illnesses are caused by viruses and about 15% by bacteria. Every year, at least 90% of U.S. population suffers from viral disease. Fungal infections that are not life-threatening, such as skin, nail, or vaginal yeast infections, are common. Some infections can be more serious. Lung infections like valley fever or histoplasmosis can happen in people who live in or visit certain areas. People can get sick when they breathe in dust and can, that contain valley fever fungus. The fungus that cause valley fever cannot spread from between people. It could spread only through contaminated dust. It is infectious disease, but not contagious disease. Fungal meningitis is deadly. Most of these cases occur in immunocompromised people. Most common not life-threatening fungal infections are athlete's foot, jack itch, ringworm, and yeast infections. Following our plan, I want you now to understand differences between signs and symptoms. Signs and symptoms are abnormalities that can indicate potential medical condition. People may confuse signs and symptoms, but there are important differences. A symptom is a manifestation of disease apparent to the patient himself. Symptoms represent the complaints of the patient, and if severe, they drive him to the doctor's office. Sign is a manifestation of disease that physician perceives. For example, a lightheadedness can only ever be a symptom because no one else can observe it. Same with any pain, either sinus pain from congestion or chest or back pain, it is all symptoms. This includes stomach cramps. Vision disturbances including double vision, blurred vision, eye flashes, less obvious breaks in normal function, fatigue, numbness are also symptoms that can only be recognized by a person experiencing them. 
but high or low blood pressure fevers can be measured and observed by another person. Those are signs. Changes detected by MRI, ultrasound or X-ray, heart murmurs, hyperglycemia, skin rash, cough are all signs. The sign is objective evidence of disease. A sign is a health issue that can be observed. Sign can be identified by anyone, but should be professionally diagnosed by doctors who have the training and experience to identify their possible cause. Many signs are able to be measured by doctors, which is an important part of the diagnosis. A symptom is subjective, meaning that other people only know about them if informed by the individual with the condition. If you're having symptoms, you're the only person who can describe them. A symptom is something an individual experiences, while a sign is something a doctor or other person notices. Regardless who notices that the system of a body part is not functioning normally, signs and symptoms are the body's ways of letting person know that not everything is running smoothly. A syndrome is a group of signs and symptoms that occurs together and characterize a particular abnormality or condition. Now we will examine the patterns of the disease, or using in other words, stages of the disease or periods of the disease. Infection typically occurs in five stages. Incubation period, prodromal period, period of illness, period of decline, and period of convalescence. An incubation period is the time between when a person is exposed to an infectious agent and when the person begins to develop symptoms. So this is a period when you are infected but do not have a disease. The pathogen start to multiply and increase in number. Prodromal period is when you started to have mild signs and symptoms, but symptoms are not specific. You might feel tired a bit more than usual and feel a bit feverish. The period of illness is when you are getting sicker and sicker until you feel really bad. Well, how bad it depends on the disease you get. The period of decline is the period when you turn the corner and you feel better and better with each day. In the period of convalescence, you are regaining your strains. You feeling better, but still you have to take things easier. You are still infectious during the period of convalescence. So how long does it take before the signs and symptoms develop after you have been infected? It is all depends on the type of infection you get. Let's say one was infected with TB. Most people infected with the germ that caused TB never develop tuberculosis. If tuberculosis does develop, it can occur two to three months after infection or years later. The risk of TB disease lessens as time passes. If one is infected with leprosy, one might have no symptoms for up to six years before the first symptoms will appear. If one was bitten by an animal infected with rabies, the infection period will depend on how close the bite was to the brain. If animal bit you in your foot, you have more time to get rabies shot than if you have been bitten in the face. If you were bitten in the face, you really have to hurry. The rabies virus hides in from immune system. It moves around in the infected individual through nerves, causing nerve damage until it gets to the brain and kills the host. Yes, if left untreated, rabies is nearly always fatal. Rabies is an acute viral infection transmitted to humans by a bite or by the exposure of broken skin to an infected animal saliva. Immunization given early can usually prevent the disease. The first dose of four doses should be administrated as soon as possible after exposure. It is preferably within 24 hours, but certainly within 72 hours. The incubation period of the common flu is typically between one to three days. Similar incubation period for flu. The incubation period for COVID-19 ranges from two to 14 days with an average of five to six days. As you can imagine, other periods of illness vary greatly depending on the disease one gets. 
Diseases are differentiated by its severity and duration. There are acute diseases, chronic diseases, and subacute diseases. Acute and chronic diseases are very different, so they categorize differently. The major difference is how long the symptoms will last. Acute illnesses generally develop suddenly and last a short time, often only a few days or weeks. Examples are flu, pink eye, and urinary tract infections. There are some acute diseases, however, that come on suddenly and produce life-threatening symptoms. This includes heart attack, asthma attack, pneumonia, appendicitis, organ failure, and acute bronchitis. Rabies, Ebola, anthrax, and smallpox are fatal acute diseases, also known as high-consequence pathogens. Unlike acute illnesses, chronic conditions develop slowly and may worsen over the extended period of time, months to years. Subacute illness is a medical problem that is not exactly acute or chronic, but rather somewhere in between. Subacute means somewhat moderately acute. Subacute infection fall in between acute and chronic in character, especially when closer to acute. Here is an example. Last month, a woman could climb three flights. Last week only two, and this week one, only one. This is mild heart failure. Subacute bacterial endocarditis is often caused by a particular group of streptococcal bacteria that usually live in your mouth and throat. Subacute condition uh, or illness can be improved if treated appropriately, but they might be difficult to diagnose, and if you ignore or mismanage them, they can spiral out of control. Latent infection is an infection that is hidden, inactive, or dormant. Traditional examples of latent microbes include Mycobacterium tuberculosis and herpes viruses. Some people get infection but do not develop any signs or symptoms. For example, some people get infected with fungus coccidioides, which cause valley fever. The common signs and symptoms are cough and fever. Many people who are in, in exposed to fungus coccidioides never have symptoms. Other people may have symptoms that go away on their own after weeks to months. It is always a good idea to talk to your doctor, because this initial acute illness can develop into more serious disease, including chronic and disseminated coccidioidal mycosis. It can lead to meningitis and bone and joint Infections. Other examples of infections that do not cause symptoms initially are HIV, human papilloma virus, herpes simplex virus, syphilis, and hepatitis B and C. The first time a person will be aware of many asymptomatic conditions is during a visit to a doctor, normally concerning a different problem. It is important to undergo regular health checks to identify any underlying problems that may not be obvious. Systemic diseases such as influenza, the flu, affect the entire body. An infection that is in the bloodstream is called systemic infection. Septicemia is when bacteria enters the bloodstream and cause blood poisoning. This can trigger sepsis, but sepsis can also come from other infections. Sepsis is a serious condition in which the body responds appropriately to an infection. The infection-fighting processes turn on the body, causing the organs to work poorly. Sepsis may progress to septic shock. This is a dramatic drop in blood pressure and can damage the lung, kidneys, liver, and other organs. Bacterial infections cause mass cases of sepsis. Sepsis can also be a result of other infections, including viral infections such as COVID-19 or influenza or fungal infections. Most people who develop sepsis the sepsis have at least one underlying medical condition, such as chronic lung disease or weakened immune system. Bacteremia is the presence of bacteria in the bloodstream. Bacteremia may result from ordinary activities, such as vigorous tooth brushing, dental or medical procedures, or from infections such as pneumonia. Pneumonia is one of the most common causes of death worldwide. Viremia is the presence of viruses in the blood. Some common or well-known cases of viremia include HIV infection, influenza, viral pneumonia, viral meningitis, measles, mumps, and rubella. An infection that affects only one body part or organ is called localized infection. Abscesses and urinary bladder infections are examples of local infections. Focal infection is a localized infection that can lead to a chronic and acute disease at another location in the body. Often, focal infections are asymptomatic. Focal infections are fairly infrequent and limited to a fairly uncommon diseases. On the beginning of 20th century, there was a focal infection theory that claimed to explain origin of virtually all diseases in human body, including arthritis, atherosclerosis, uh, cancer, and mental illnesses. 
As you may guess, this theory accused focal infections in causing such diseases. This theory was discredited in the 1940s by overwhelming research evidence. A secondary infection is one that occurs when a different infection, known as primary infection, has made a person more susceptible to a disease. It is called a secondary infection because it occurs either after or because of the another infection. For example, you are sick with a flu. As you know, it is caused by a virus and not long ago there was no medication that could destroy that virus. Your body had to defeat the virus using its own resources. So why sometimes your doctor was prescribing you antibiotics when you struggle to recover from the flu? This antibiotic was not to destroy the flu virus, but to destroy the secondary infection and onset of bacterial infection because of the weakening of your body defenses. Secondary infection also may move in because of the treatment for the primary infection. For example, a vaginal yeast infection often occurs after taking antibiotics to treat an infection caused by bacteria. The relatively high incidence of severe infection and mortality in COVID-19 is thought in part to due, due to secondary infections. Secondary infection is not to be confused with co-infection. Co-infection is a simultaneous infection of a host by multiple pathogen species. For example, people can be co-infected with both gonorrhea, syphilis, and genital herpes. Those infections are not necessarily related to each other. Instead, they are both related to the similar types of activity. Another example of co-infection is infection with hepatitis D virus. You see, in order to be infected with hepatitis D, one has to be infected with hepatitis B virus. This is because in order to propagate, the hepatitis D virus requires the presence of hepatitis B virus, which includes the code protein for hepatitis D virus, putting it in a category of subviral satellite viruses. Hepatitis D is considered as a co-infection and superinfection. Now I want to elaborate on how infectious diseases could be transmitted to humans. First of all, let's answer the question, where do diseases are coming from? Where do they hide? You see, there is such a term as reservoir of infection. Reservoir includes places in the environment where pathogen lives. This includes people, animals and insects, medical equipment and soil and water. Coccidioides fungi, which cause valley fever, resides in the soil and can cause infection when its microscopic spore are released into the air because of the disturbances. So, soil is a reservoir for valley fever. Soil also is a reservoir for tetanus and gas gangrene. Tetanus and gas gangrene caused by bacteria, not by pathogenic fungi. Soil is a good example of non-living reservoir of infectious diseases. Another good example of non-living reservoir of infectious disease is water that had been contaminated by feces of humans and other animals. Indeed, it is a reservoir for several pathogens, notably those responsible for gastrointestinal diseases. This includes Vibrio cholera, which causes cholera, and Salmonella typhi, which causes typhoid fever. Non-living reservoirs include foods that are improperly prepared or stored. They may be source of disease such as salmonellosis or trichinellosis. Trichinellosis results from round worms. It is a parasitic infection. It is caused by consuming undercooked or raw meat, usually pork. Both wild and domestic animals are living reservoirs of microorganisms that can cause human diseases. Toxoplasmosis is caused by Toxoplasma gondii, protis, and eukaryotic parasite. People often get infection from contact with cat's feces. The parasite can pass to a baby during pregnancy. Most babies with Toxoplasmosis do not show symptoms, but problems may show up later in childhood or teenage years, causing problems with thinking and learning, problems with motor skill development, and early puberty. Most people infected with the parasite do not have symptoms. The disease is more serious in people with weakened immunity. The white-footed mouse is the reservoir for the Lyme disease, and the tick is the vector, meaning the one that spreads the infection. The infectious agent is a bacteria that looks like a corkscrew. The name of the, this bacteria is Borrelia burgdorferi. The principal living reservoir of human diseases is the human body itself. Many people harbor pathogen and transmit them directly or indirectly to others. People with signs and symptoms of the diseases may transmit the diseases. In addition, some people can harbor pathogens and transmit them to others without exhibiting any signs of illness. 
These people called carriers are important living reservoirs of infection. Some people carry diseases during symptom-free stages, during incubation period, or during convalescence period, period of recovery. Malaria is caused by plasmodium parasites. Transmission requires an intermediate mosquito host, which is found worldwide. So a mosquito is a vector of the disease. Humans are a reservoir for the malaria disease. The infected mosquito carries the disease from one human to another acting as a vector, while infected human transmit the parasite to the mosquito. In contrast to the human host, the mosquito vector does not suffer from the presence of the parasites. Interesting, isn't it? Chikungunya virus is transmitted to humans via a bite of an infected mosquito. Mosquitoes become infected when they feed on infected non-human or human primates, both of which are likely the main amplifying a reservoir of the virus. Chikungunya virus does spread from human to person only by a bite of mosquito who has bitten someone who is sick. Humans are the main source or reservoir of the chikungunya virus. Symptoms are similar to dengue, pain in joints that can last for two years. It can it also comes with headaches and rushes. Diseases can be transmitted by vectors either mechanically or biologically. Last examples of transmission are good examples of biological transmission. You see the vectors, ticks and mosquitoes, not only transmit the infection but serve as a host for infectious agents to multiply. This is what we call biological transmission. Arboviral disease is a general term used to describe infections caused by a group of viruses spread to people by the bite of infected insects such as mosquitoes and ticks. These uh, infections usually occur during warm weather months when mosquitoes and ticks are active. Examples include California encephalitis, uh, chikungunya, dengue, eastern Iguin encephalitis, Powassan, St. Louis encephalitis, West Nile, yellow fever, and Zika. Other diseases spread by the bite of infected insects that are not viral infections, such as Lyme disease, which is a bacterial infection, and Babesiosis, which is parasitic infections, are not arboviruses. In opposite to biological transmission, there is a mechanical transmission. Mechanical transmission means the transfer of pathogen from an infected host or contaminated substrate to a susceptible host, where a biological association between the pathogen and the vector is not necessary. Mechanical vectors such as house flies, mice, rats, dogs, cats, and even humans can pick up an infection agent on the outside of their body and transmit them through physical contact. House flies are known to transmit bacterial, parasitic, and viral diseases to humans and animals as mechanical vectors. Zoonosis is an infectious disease that has jumped from animal to humans. There are over 200 known types of zoonosis. Zoonotic pathogen can spread to humans through direct contact or through water, food, or the environment. They represent major public health problem around the world due to our close relationship with animals in agriculture, as a companions, and in the natural environment. Zoonosis comprise a large percentage of all newly identified infectious diseases, as well as many existing ones. Some diseases such as HIV begin as zoonosis but later mutate into human-only strains. Other zoonosis can cause recurring disease outbreaks such as Ebola virus disease and salmonellosis. Direct contact infections spread when disease-causing microorganisms pass from the infected person to the healthy person via direct physical contact with blood or body fluids. Examples of direct contact are touching, kissing, sexual contact, contact with oral secretions, or contact with body lesions. Indirect contact transmission occurs when there is no direct human-to-human -human contact. Indirect contact infections spread when an infected person sneezes or coughs, sending infectious droplets into the air. If healthy person inhales the infectious droplets or if contaminated droplets land directly in their eyes, nose or mouth, they risk becoming ill. Droplets generally travel between 3 to 6 feet and land on surfaces or subjects including tables, doorknobs and phones. Healthy people touch the contaminated objects with their hands and then touch their eyes, nose or mouth, introducing into their body the pathogen. Airborne transmission occurs when the tiny particles can stay in the air for a long time and travel longer distances. Airborne diseases are common called 
flu, measles, and tuberculosis. Some particles, such as a fungus aspergillus, are widely present in the environment. It occurs in soil, plants, including decomposing plant matter, household dust, and building materials, as well as food and water. During building renovations, breathing in dust that contains the fungus may cause diseases in some humans. Thus, fungus aspergillus causes airborne diseases. Same with the bacteria anthrax. It is present in the soil in many places around the world. When dust forms from the soil, a person can become sick if they breathe in anthrax spores. A fomite refers to inanimate objects that can carry and spread disease and infectious agents. Fomites can also be called passive vectors. It has been estimated that people living in industrialized countries can spend 90% of their time indoors. This means that there is a huge potential for fomites to be found in homes, workplaces, and healthcare and educational facilities. Fomites commonly found inside can include countertops, handrails, doorknobs, light switches, phones, clothing. Fomites can be utensils, bedding, money, toys. Bacteria do not typically reproduce on fomites, but can be carried about on them. Vehicle transmission is a transmission of pathogen through vehicles such as water, food and air. Water contamination through poor sanitation methods leads to waterborne transmission of disease. The World Health Organization estimates that contaminated drinking water is responsible for more than half a million deaths each year. Similarly, food contamination through poor handling or storage can lead to foodborne transmission of disease. Biological products like blood, serum, plasma, tissue or organs also can be vehicles. Epidemiology is a study of how often disease occurs in different groups of people and why. Epidemiological information is used to plan and evaluate strategies to prevent illness. It also guides to the management of patients in whom disease has already developed. Thus, covering epidemiology, it is important to indicate occurrence of a disease. Two of the main concepts in epidemiology are incidence of the disease and prevalence of the disease. Incidents refer to the number of new cases being diagnosed over a period of time. And prevalence refer to the number of people currently diagnosed with the disease. Thus, incidents are disease risks, while prevalence is a disease burden. Prevalence does not differentiate between old and new cases. Prevalence and incidents are used for different purposes and to answer different research questions. Incidence is a number of new cases of a disease in a population divided by individuals at risk of susceptible population, including the new cases during the specific period of time. For example, if there were 24 new cases of hepatitis C in susceptible population of 80 people during three year period, the incidence rate is one out of 10 people per year. Prevalence is the number of affected persons in a population divided by number of persons in the population and multiply by 100. We'll say if 3 out of 10 are sick, this is 30% of people sick. The number of incidents and prevalence can be the same in short diseases or disease that can be quickly treated or the number of people who get the diseases will be the same number of people who will be treated. As you perhaps already guessed, the prevalence will be much higher in chronic or untreatable conditions. Endemic disease is a disease that is consistently present but limited to a particular region. This makes the disease spread and rate predictable. But for example, malaria, cholera, West Nile fever, Lyme disease are considered endemic in certain countries and regions. Lyme disease is endemic in northeast, northwest, and much of the north central United States, including Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, and Pennsylvania. Epidemic is an unexpected increase in the number of disease cases in the specific geographical region. Yellow fever, smallpox, measles, and polio are prime examples of epidemic. Pandemic is a disease outbreak that spans several countries and continents, affecting huge number of people. COVID-19 is a global outbreak of virus belonging to a group of coronaviruses that cause common cold. This led World Health Organization to declare public health emergency of international concern on January 30, 2020, and characterized the outbreak as a pandemic on March 11, 2020. Another example of pandemic disease is AIDS, first identified 
find in Democratic Republic of the Congo in 1976, HIV infection has truly proven itself as a global pandemic, killing more than 36 million people since 1981. Another example of pandemic is the Hong Kong flu. In 1968, flu pandemic was caused by the influenza A virus. In epidemiology, a sporadic disease is an infectious disease which occurs only infrequently, haphazardly, regularly, or occasionally from time to time in a few isolated places with no pattern as opposed to the recognizable epidemic outbreak or endemic pattern. Examples of sporadic diseases include rabies, tetanus, and plague. Now I will briefly discuss the topic of diagnosis and treatment. Even before patient appears, the doctor needs to know what is happening in the community. One will not expect to see flu in the normal year in July, but if the patient will show up with the same symptoms in January, the doctor will be certain it is flu. In order to diagnose, doctor need to hear patient presentation. Patient tells about his or her chief complaint and symptoms. This enables the doctor to quickly understand the patient's issue and generate an appropriate plan of action. But before this, doctor need to know the patient history. Was the patient exposed to infection? Has the patient traveled? If yes, where? Did the patient eat spoiled food? Was the patient bitten by an insect or other animal? And after taking all of this in consideration, doctor gives a patient medical examination. Auscultation is the act of listening to your heartbeat, breathing and other bodily sound. It can signal to doctors that something unusual is going on inside your body. Word auscultare means to listen to. It is a Latin word. Another method the doctor used during their physical examination is percussion. The word originates from the Latin word percutere, to strike forcibly. Percussion is method of medical diagnosis in which various areas of the body, especially the chest, back, and abdomen are tapped to determine by resonance the condition of internal organs. Palpation means to examine or explore by touching an organ or area of the body. The word comes from Latin word palpare, to touch gently. Many infectious diseases have similar signs and symptoms. Samples of body fluids can sometimes reveal evidence of the particular microbes that is causing the illness. This helps the doctor tailor treatment. After examination or inspection of patient's body, doctor integrates all the known of him or her information and decides what laboratory test will be necessary to run. After samples of blood, urine, or anything else are collected, they are going for laboratory analysis. Direct microscopic observation of a fresh or stained specimen is one of the most rapid methods of determining presumed microbial characteristic. The gram stain and acid stain are most often used for bacterial identification, but they can identify only a few organisms on their own. The technique is not very specific. Non-sterile specimens such as urine and feces are cultured on selective media to encourage the growth of only the suspected pathogen. Specimens are often inoculated into differential media to identify definitive characteristics such as reaction in blood and fermentation patterns. To identify the micro, pure cultures of microbe must be obtained from culturing or isolation media. Clinical microbiologists can then observe the suspected pathogen, microscopic morphology, and staining reactions, cultural appearance, motility, and oxygen requirements. Also, antibiotic sensitivity tests could be done. Antigen diagnostic tests detect structural features of the outside of the virus called antigens that may be present in the patient sample. Antigens are specific viral proteins. This test is likely to detect virus during the period when someone is most infectious. This is the test you perhaps use at home to detect either you have COVID-19 or not. Serology is a branch of immunology that traditionally deals with in vitro diagnostic testing serum. Antibody serology test checks for the presence or level of specific antibodies in the blood. Antibodies are proteins that your immune system makes to fight foreign substances. They are highly specific. Thus, a serologic test can determine whether a person has been exposed to a particular microorganism or not. 
Each pathogen, as any other organism, has its own genome, either it is DNA-based or RNA-based. It is what makes each organism special. It is like a biological tag that organism has. Therefore, to detect the organism, all we need is its DNA or RNA. We use it as an indicator of its presence or absence in the sample that we run through molecular testing. Molecular tests look for changes in one or more genes. These types of tests determine the order of DNA building blocks in an individual's genetic code and process called DNA sequencing. In our days, it is not enough just to identify what causes the disease but pinpoint the strain of the bacteria or virus. We'll say someone is diagnosed with tuberculosis. This disease is caused by bacteria called Mycobacterium tuberculosis. But as we know, microorganisms evolve. They change within the time to better fit the environment. This is how drug-resistant strains appear. Genomic sequencing is a powerful tool that helps us to identify strain of this bacteria to improve diagnosis and disease surveillance. DNA or RNA is isolated from a patient sample and put in the sequencing machine. This powerful computer analyzes the molecules, identifying if this particular strain is going to be resistant to a medication usually used in the treatment. Many nucleic acid assay use polymerase chain reaction, abbreviated as PCR. This method can amplify many quantities of DNA present in a sample. PCR tests continue to detect virus days or even weeks after someone is no longer infectious. The rapidity of PCR diagnostic tests is valuable when waiting for cultures of lab results. Some viruses like COVID do not have DNA in their genome, but have RNA instead. So in order to detect them, the RNA has to be first transcribed into DNA molecule. This is the goal of reverse transcriptase PCR, abbreviated as RT-PCR. But sometimes clinicians want to know the amount of viruses in the sample from the infected individual. For this, they run real-time PCR, which is abbreviated as RT-PCR, same as reverse transcriptase PCR. This could be confusing in communication. Therefore, real-time PCR test is sometimes abbreviated as QPCR. Q stands for quantitative. If pathogenic bacteria, virus, fungus, or parasitic proteins get into your body and started causing diseases, what are you to do? Only doctor will be able to provide you with the right strategy to treat the infection. In order to understand what is really happening, you need to consult a doctor, and doctor will have to run all sort of medical tests. So what all of this will do for you if you get an infectious disease? There will be two ways to solve the problem. One is to reduce the effect of the disease, and another is to destroy the cause of the disease. Let's see the first approach. Sign the symptoms appear because of the body response to the infection. It is inflammatory response. Inflammatory response is the state of the body or body parts when your organism is at, at war with the invaders. In the future, I will post a few lectures dedicated to this topic. For now, you need to know uh, that to trigger an inflammatory response, your body activates all sorts of white blood cells. All kinds of infl inflammatory chemicals are produced to keep body's war going. As a result, you might end up with a high fever, pain, fatigue, redness, swollenness, Itchiness, etc. Depending on the condition, doctor might advise you to take over-the-counter medications that will reduce annoying problems. Doctor might even prescribe you a special medication that might help you to go through the day while your body is doing its best to get rid of the pathogen. You see, so far we do not have effective medication against most of the viruses. This is why only your own body can defend you from the most of viral infections. Antiviral drugs are effective against only an extremely limited group of diseases. They are used only to treat such viruses like AIDS, herpes, influenza, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and recently flu. If you get sick with the flu, antiviral drugs are treatment option. Check with your doctor promptly if you, have, if you are at higher risk of serious flu complications. Your doctor may prescribe antiviral drugs to treat your flu illness. But why don't we have more antiviral drugs? So far, only hepatitis C can be cured with antiviral drugs. This is because viruses replicate with the host cell using genetic and metabolic mechanisms of host own cells. It is hard to target the virus without damaging the host cell mechanery. However, as more becomes known about the replication of viruses, more targets should suggest themselves for antiviral action. 
Antibiotics are used to treat bacterial infections and have absolutely no effect on viral infections. Antibiotics are grouped together in classes similar to types of bacteria. Certain antibiotics are more effective with certain groups of bacteria. Antimicrobial drugs are either bactericidal, they kill bacteria directly, or bacteriostatic, they prevent bacteria from growing. In bacteriostasis, the host own defenses usually destroy the bacteria. The different antibiotics destroy bacteria differently. Some, like penicillin, prevent bacterial cell wall synthesis. This causes cell to weaken and the cell undergoes rupture, or as we say, it lysis. Because human cells do not have cell walls, penicillin has very little toxicity for host cell. There are some antibiotics such as chloramphenicol, erythromycin, streptomycin, and the tetracycline inhibit bacterial protein synthesis. Other types of antibiotics inhibit synthesis of the plasma membrane. Example is tuberculosis drug isoniazid. It blocks bacterial synthesis of fatty acid. There are some antibiotics interfere with the process of DNA replication and transcription in microbes, but they have extremely limited usefulness because they interfere with mammalian DNA and RNA as well. Management of antibiotics should be careful since their overuse can produce resistance to their effectiveness, making bacterial infection more difficult to treat. As you learned earlier during this lecture, some diseases, including malaria, caused by tiny parasites. I refer to them as a protist. While there are drugs to treat these diseases, some varieties of parasites have developed resistance to the drugs. Fungal infections are very common in people with weakened immune system and can affect the mucous membrane of the mouth and throat as well as the lungs. Antifungal drugs are used to treat severe fungal infections. Fungi as animals use the same mechanism of synthesis proteins, DNA and RNA. Therefore, it is more difficult to find a point of selective toxicity in this organism as well as in protists and helminths. Many antifungal drugs target the sterols in the plasma membrane. In fungal membrane, the principal sterol is ergosterol. In animal membranes, as you know, it is cholesterol. When the biosynthesis of ergosterol in fungal membrane is interrupted, the membrane becomes excessively permeable, killing the cell. Inhibition of ergosterol biosynthesis is the basis for selective toxicity of the many antifungals. Antilmintic drugs are any drugs that attack against infections caused by parasitic worms. Helminths are divided into three groups, cestodes or tapeworms, nematodes or roundworms, and trematodes or flukes. The helminths differ from other infectious organisms in that, that they have complex body structure. They are multicellular and have partial or complete organ systems, muscular, nervous, digestive, and reproductive. Some antilmintic drugs inhibit the uptake of the glucose by the worm and therefore the production of energy. It has a spasmic or paralytic effect on the worm. Others produce tetanus-like contractions of the musculature of the worm. Medications that we just briefly overviewed not only used in treating diseases, but in some instances also can be used to prevent infections before or after one is exposed to a disease. Thus, there is such thing as a pre- and post-exposure prophylaxis. Pre-exposure prophylaxis is medication taken to prevent getting the infection, and the post-exposure prophylaxis is short course of medication taken very soon after possible exposure to infection to prevent the infection from taking hold in your body. Example of pre-exposure prophylaxis is taking medication to prevent getting HIV. PrEP highly effective for preventing HIV when taken as prescribed. Thus, PrEP reduces the risk of getting HIV from sex by about 99%, and PrEP reduces the risk of getting HIV from injecting drug use by at least 74%. Since PrEP only protects against HIV, condom use is still important for the protection against other sexually transmitted diseases. Gundam use is also important to prevent HIV if PrEP is not taken as prescribed. Example of post-exposure prophylaxis could be a short course of HIV medication taken very soon after a possible exposure to HIV. One must start within 72 hours, three days after a possible exposure to HIV or it won't work. Every hour counts. PEP should be used only in emergency situation. It is not meant for regular use by people who may be exposed to HIV frequently. PEP may be right for one if one is HIV negative or don't know his or her HIV status and one have been exposed to HIV within the last 72 hours. Here are examples of the situations. During sex, you had a Gundam break with a partner of unknown HIV status or partner with HIV who is not virally suppressed. 
Another one is through shared needles, syringes or other equipment used to inject drugs, for example cookers. Another example through sexual assault or possible workplace exposure, such as needle stick injury, though workplace HIV transmission is extremely rare. If you think you were recently exposed to HIV, contact the healthcare provider immediately or go to an emergency room or urgent care clinic right away. Your healthcare provider, an emergency care provider or emergency room doctor will evaluate you, will help you decide where the PEP is right for you and work to the, determine which, which medication to take for PEP. Use the HIV Gov locator to find PEP services near you. It, in some cases, pharmacies can also prescribe PEP. Once again, PEP should be used only in emergency situation. It is not intended to uh, replace regular use of other HIV prevention methods. If you feel that you might be exposed to HIV frequently, talk to your healthcare professional about PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis. Okay, enough to talk specifically about HIV. Let's go back to general topic preventing diseases. Another way to prevent infectious diseases is behavior change. Behavior change can reduce or eliminate the risk of exposure due to an infectious agent. According to the CDC, hand washing is the single most important means of preventing the spread of infection. Preventing infectious diseases focuses on hygiene and making it difficult for our organism to spread. It is important to keep your hands away from your mouth and nose, as well as maintain a hygienic, sanitary household with special attention to the kitchen and bathrooms. Do not share personal items. One has to be up to date on vaccination. To reduce the risk of viral infections and to avoid insect bites, we should use cover up and use insect repellent. We should avoid touching wild animals. Also, one should drink or eat food only from trusted sources. Another important way to avoid infections is to use protection during sex. Vaccination is a simple, safe and effective way of protecting people against harmful diseases before they come into contact with them. All adults, especially parents and grandparents, need to be vaccinated. The CDC advises half a dozen specific vaccines for adults. The vaccine every adult needs are DTAP or DT in one shot. One will be protected from tetanus, diphtheria and perdusis, often called whipping cough. Another shot of MMR vaccine will protect you from measles, mumps and rubella. If you are not immunized against chickenpox and you suspect you never had the disease, the best thing to do is to schedule vaccination. Chickenpox could be deadly for an adult individual. As infections of the liver, both hepatitis A and B, can cause lifelong, often irreparable liver damage. The pneumococcal vaccine protects you from the virus that causes pneumonia. Upward of 1 million Americans are hospitalized due to pneumonia each year. Vulnerable groups such as infants, young children, the elderly, and those with compromised immune system are especially at risk for complication from the virus, such as meningitis and blood infections. The vaccine is available for your protection and the protection of those around you. Modifying the environment is another way to control infectious diseases. By modifying the environment, we can improve vector control, improve sanitation facility and hygiene, make safe water and food supply, and improve air quality. Nasocomial infection does not show any evidence of being present or incubating at the time of admission to a hospital. It is acquired as a result of hospital stay. Infection control requires sterilization of equipment, medical personnel wearing protective clothing, isolation of infectious patients by using isolation rooms and wards, regular cleaning of medical facilities, hand washing, and hospital surveillance system. The infection control officer should make periodic examination of hospital equipment to determine the extent of microbial contamination. Samples should be taken from tubing, catheters, respirator reservoirs, and other equipment. Infectious disease surveillance is an important epidemiological tool to monitor disease burden and the epidemiology of disease and identify outbreaks and new pathogens. Epidemiology is a major concern of state and federal public health departments. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, a branch of the U.S. Public Health Service located in Atlanta, Georgia, is a central source of epidemiological information in the United States. The CDC issues a publication called Mobility and Mortality Weekly Report. The Mobility and Mortality Weekly contains data on mobility, the incidence of specific notifiable diseases, and mortality, the number of deaths from diseases. The data are usually organized by state. 
Notifiable infectious diseases are diseases for which physicians are required by law to report cases to the U.S. Public Health Service. School-based health education help adolescents acquire functional health knowledge, strengthens attitude, and practice skill needed to adapt and maintain healthy behavior throughout their lives. Scientists are continually challenged to find better ways to prevent and protect us from a whole host of infectious diseases. Their new innovations take many shapes. Many are about making better, cheaper, and faster tests. Some of the su standout diagnostics include new ways to identify, stop, deadly, and drug-resistant bugs from spreading in healthcare settings. This cutting-edge scientist found a faster way to test dogs for rabies, for flushing out parasites in swimming pools, and even for identifying a virus in pet rats. They have applied whole genome sequencing to help stop foodborne outbreaks in their trucks. Laboratorians have found new techniques like using laser to more accurately diagnose Zika virus infection, and mobile app first responders can use in the field during an outbreak response. Public health emergencies have spurred some of these seemingly overnight discoveries, but other innovations have been incubating for a while. The just-approved test to diagnose Rocky Mountain spotted fever was 10 years in the making. As you've seen, in summary, the main disease characteristics are causative agent, signs and symptoms, patterns of disease, reservoir transmission, epidemiology, diagnosis, treatment, and prevention. Thank you.